Can we talk about the Strokes? Who? Oh, <laughs> wait, I have a sticker. Yeah. So this was something that a lot of people were interested in. I can see why. Hearing about. They're very good. Um, but I mean, yeah. let's start with how you first became involved with them. How, how I first them? became involved. <laughs> well, so I had my first studio where I learned Logic Pro, and then that I got it. We got evicted out of that studio because they wanted to make a store out of it, a shop out of it. And so I got a second. I made a second studio called Transport Around, and it was in a very awesome area in the East Village in New York where all the clubs were and restaurants. Every artist and young people loved that area. It was so exciting. And so I would go see bands play in the bars and the clubs around and I'd have a little blue business card and I'd say, hey, you guys are good. Uh, come to my studio. I can make a really cheap demo and you'll like it. And so on just such a night as this, I went to the Luna Lounge and two bands played. The first band was called Come On, and they were incredible. I loved that band. They seemed like the new Beatles. They had like all these harmonies and British Invasion, if you know what that is. Like, that's the term we use in America. Uh, they had this kind of in British Invasion guitar sound and these harmonies, and I just loved this band. And I went to them, and I said, hey, I've got a studio down the street. I can make good demos cheap. And they said, thanks a lot. Then this other band came on. They're called The Strokes. And I didn't like them as much as Come On. Like, I thought they seemed very proud of themselves. They were playing for 40 people in this very small club, about this room about this size, half full. Um, but I saw them after, afterwards going to get their guitar pedals on the stage. So I went up to them and said, hey, you know, I, I do demos if you want to do a demo. And they came. They, came, they sent Albert to check out my studio. And he really liked the way it was decorated and some of the music I played. So they wound up coming in for a three-day, three-song demo deal. And, and that's how we started. Just like that? Yeah. Um, and then how did that, so was that kind of like, that just sparked things then after that demo, they started yeah. to gain more traction and then well, debut came to you? It's a very all. unusual story. I mean, I've been in the music business, as I said, for a very long time. I've never heard a story where a band makes a demo and then a record label loves the demo so much that they don't put the band in the studio to make a professional version. They put the demo out as a record, and the record blows up. So it was like they took this demo that was just supposed to get them into the clubs where instead of losing $50 on taxi money, they might get paid $100 and some free beer. So they, their idea is to make a demo and go to the next level from the bottom level of clubs to play in New York. They had only played in this certain area in New York. They had never played even above 14th Street. And now suddenly they're jetting off to England and UK for a tour because Rough Trade put their demo out and they called it the Modern Age EP. And everybody loved it. So uh, crazy. And then how did, so would they come <laughs> off that point, they're like, we have such great success with the EP, let's, let's do the debut with you? Well. Funny you mention it. This is one of the best stories in my book. I go into micro detail about this. So I'm at my studio in New York while they're like doing great stuff over here, touring and NMEs writing about them. Even the American Rolling Stone magazine was writing about this unsigned band just because there was such a reaction to them in the UK. So I'm like in my studio going like, whoa, maybe I'm going to be famous. Hmm, this could be great. I, what, what kind of car do I want? Where, where should I live? And I was already like going way down, you know, because I'd never seen anything I'd ever recorded be talked about in a magazine or people listening to it. It's like, wow, this was new. I knew something was happening. So I'm anxious to see what's going to happen next. And I get a call from Julian when he comes back from this tour. And he says, hey, Gordon, can we go out to dinner? I go, sure, sure, love to. So I go out to dinner with Julianne to a place called 7A in the neighborhood where my studio is. And he, we sit down and we order dinner. And um, it's a tattooed waitress, a really cool rock and roll uh, cafe. I really liked it. And as soon as she leaves with our order, Julian says, so Gordon, um, Rough Trade wants us to use a different producer for our album. They want us to make an album, but they want to use this other guy. And I'm really shocked. You know, what? Who is it? And he says, 
His name's Gil Norton. And I go, oh, shit, he's really good. I knew who he was because he recorded the, the Foo Fighters, Color and the Shape album, and he did the Pixies. And like Every record he sold since the 80s sold like 5 million copies. Okay, and so then, so my heart is just sinking. Oh my God, he's like one of those really big producers. And so Julian says, Gordon, if you tell me that you're a better producer than him, we'll use you for the album. Because our band has one shot, you know, we got to do the best. So, you know, are you a better producer than him? And I'm thinking, dude, I'm, th this, I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> Dude, this guy sells five million of everything he's done for the past ten years, and I've never sold a single CD. I've never sold a record. How am I going to tell Julia I'm a better producer? Like, what, what? How could I? So I said, "Hey, Julian, you know we did a great. We did this EP together, and everybody likes that sound. And I can't say I'm better than this guy who sells five million records. You know, I can't tell you that." And he just stands up before the food even comes. He says. Fuck you. Now I got to go use that guy. And he grabs his coat and he leaves me as two burger meals come. His and mine are put down in front of me and he's gone. And I'm thinking, shit, you know, why did I, why couldn't I lie? Why couldn't I, do, you know, Jesus, I, I could have been famous. You know, there, there goes my future just walking out the door and I just let it happen. You know, I was really upset about it and spent the next few weeks working with other bands trying to not think about that situation. Wow. Okay? That's, thanks for asking. <laughs> yeah. How, how did it come back around then? Well, I was at my house having breakfast one day, apartment rather, New York City, and the phone rings. And my phone rarely rang. It was a landline. I pick it up, hello? And it's, hey, Gordon, it's Julian. Said, Julian, what's up? He goes, do you still have that studio? I go, yeah. This is like only about three weeks later. I go, yeah, why? He said, well, we recorded with Gil Norton and we don't want anybody to hear that sound. Like, that's not our sound. I go, what? What happened? Let's go to coffee. You know, let's meet right now. He said, no, sorry, we're on tour in Chicago with the Doves. You know, but when we get back, we'll have a meeting about it. And he said, by the way, the band doesn't think you could get our sound again. We think it was a one-off, you know, that you got lucky. And we kind of don't really think you can get the sound, but we need to try. And, and so that was, that, and I was like jumping, I was literally jumping up and down, like, oh my God, you know, I got it back. Didn't that still, didn't that feel like a twisted compliment though, to be like, oh, the band I doesn't think I think, I think after get working it. with him already for the three days of the thing and having the different, I've had a few experiences like one of them I talk about in the book where they were playing these residency shows before they took off or after they came back, before we made the album, before I was even supposed to work on the album. And like Julian was really drunk one night and he like saw me and he gave me a giant hug and he like kind of wouldn't let go. I'm thinking like, okay. And he goes, Gordon, aren't you happy for us how much success we're having and how things are going? I go, yes, Julian, I'm really pleased. He goes, don't you wish you'd made a contract with us for that record? Because you're not getting anything. I said, fuck you. I like pushed him away. So I, I was used to kind of hearing unusual things from him. Mm -hmm. I really respected him for his music. And I, I actually loved part of his personality. But I was used to kind of uh, stings and, and weird twists and turns from him already by the time we were working on the album. Okay, well, that's, I suppose okay. that's good that you'd learn to kind of yeah, yeah. deflect it a bit. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, talking about that sound, um, that's what a lot of these questions are about. So let's stick with Julian. How, okay. Could you talk us through the process of producing his vocals for that? Well, we have to go back a couple steps. Mm -hmm. Maybe this is going to cover something. Like, again, I get this band, The Strokes. I'd seen them one time. I didn't really dig their sound. I didn't know what they were trying to do but I didn't know if it was the club or what. So I didn't know what I was dealing with. And I bring them in the control room after they put their equipment up. And I said, so what are we doing here? What do you want to do? And like Fab goes, hey, well, uh, you know what everybody else is doing in New York? I go, yeah. That's what we don't want to do. I go, OK. Actually, that gave me an idea. What everybody else in New York was doing in the year 2000 was Pro Tools was now coming into every studio for the first time. Like, basically, this was the time in the world where 
tape decks were kind of being broken and were moved out and Pro Tools computers were being put in. So everybody was making the biggest productions they possibly could. You'd record a kick drum with three microphones and then you'd put an 808 sample under that and a Bob Clear Mountain sample under that. So everything was complicated and huge. So I said, hmm, what people aren't doing is I have eight microphones in my capability. I had one 888 interface that took eight mics. I put them around the room. Go play your song in that room and we'll record it like that and that will be what people aren't doing. So they said, okay, that sounds good. So they did that and they loved the sound. They said, yeah, that's it, that's it, dude. You know, we love, they, so that didn't take anything. Just like eight microphones, they play the song and that was the sound of those first records right there. Mm -hmm. Then it came time for the vocals. And I said, well, Julian, what do you want to do for the vocals? He goes, I don't know, you know, just uh, use your best judgment. So I thought, okay, I'm going to do something really interesting. Throughout the 90s, while everyone else was listening to the grunge music, I was involved in industrial music. It was a genre with heavy synthesizers, heavy drum machines, and everything was distorted. The drum machines were distorted, the synthesizers were distorted, and the vocals were shredded like into nuclear oblivion. So I thought, hey, Julian, check this out. And I took his voice and I gave it the most distortion I possibly could from the preamp, like on 10, everything on 10, just the most aggressive, annoying, destructive sound I possibly could. And I said, get out there and sing your song. So he sang the song and he came in and I said, check this out. And I pressed play and I said, how do you like that? He goes, that's ugly, man. I hate it. I hate it. I go, oh, okay. So then he said, but you know how your favorite jeans, like they don't have holes in them, but they're not new? I go, what, what the fuck are you talking? What, dude? Tell me more, <laughs> more treble, less overdrive. Like, what do you want? And not, but then it dawned on me. Wait a second. You're, you're, it's kind of like they're worn, but they're not destroyed. Okay. So instead of like ten, 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 what if I do like six, four, and three, and like? So it's, I kind of used my original idea, but I dialed it back significantly. And I said, okay, go try this. And he went out and he sang the song and he came in and I pressed play and him and the band were like jumping up and down. They were, dude, that's it, that's it, that's exactly right, all right. So that became the sound of the EP and the first two albums. And he took that same preamp that I was using, the Avalon, and he had his sound engineer using it for all the live shows on the first tours. And that's the technical story of how the sound of those particular records came to be. Wow. Okay. Do you think he would have started, if you'd have started that six, four, and three, he would have just been like, nah, we're not doing it, and then you've got nowhere to I go back know. on that. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It would never have dawned on me to make a sound that wasn't completely destroyed. <laughs> you know, I didn't want partial destruction. That seemed too nice. Yeah. The the guitars in is this it especially have like a really the the word that someone used was edgy a very edgy guitar sound like how did how did you create that sound like what kind of like amps were you using like what kind of distortion were you running through and things like that well first of all I recorded lots of bands at that time but nobody before the Strokes asked me to please put me on that side completely and put me on that side completely. So I was like, what, like that? Like, it's like so far apart, isn't it? How, don't you want them to blend? To, so it was this extreme panning, that's one thing. And then when anybody talks about the, the, the sound of the guitars or the guitars, I say, like, let's look at the composition. Let's look, at that time, I learned during the first album that Julian wrote all the parts. He wrote the hi-hat rhythm, he wrote the kick drum, he wrote the guitar solos, he wrote the guitar parts, okay? And so, let's go back six years before Nirvana, something like that, hugely popular. And what, how did, they, how did, Nirvana's more typical of rock and roll. You take a guitar, some amp, big amps, and you're playing these giant chords, right? Da -da -da -da. Nah, nah, like this kind of thing. And then there's some melodies on another guitar that are doing some riffs in between the vocals, but it's this giant rhythm. So what are the strokes doing? Like one guy's going like, 
nee, 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 like one little string melodies, while another guy's playing like chords on two strings really lightly, but very insistently. So this compositional technique, it's uh, counterpoint. It's not rock and roll, typical like chord with a melody. It's actually two melodies going against each other, yet complementing the vocal, which is a center melody. And a composer like Bach, he wrote that way. That was the way, that was the popular style. Nobody thought about chords. Nobody thought about stacking up sounds. They thought about, you take a beautiful melody, and then you come up with another melody that works against it. It can't be the same. It can't even be parallel. It just has to work mathematically with it. And then Bach would do three. He would have three parts being played by the hand, and then one put part being played by the foot. So four different parts moving was already a historically amazing sound back in the 1600s or something. And now here it is in rock and roll. The bass line is a melody, two guitars are playing independent melody, and the vocal is doing a fourth melody. There's none of that big rock and roll chords, at least in those early records. So part of the sound of what you're hearing is just the naked aggression of single strings and small amounts of strings being plucked. Mm. And then they wanted to hear every note. Like no note could be louder than the other one. Like, hey, I hit the second time softer. Nope, they would never have, that. it has to be like, every note had to be under control for how loud it was and how clear you could hear it against the vocal and the bass. So they worked very hard on the tone, okay? Cool. And, and if you want to know what instruments they use, I think it's widely known, you know, that Nick had this Epiphone semi-hollow body guitar, Albert used a Strat, they both used the same amps, which were Fender Hot Rod DeVille, and they both had Jekyll and Hyde distortion pedal, and that's all. And in, in, that, in that album, I had one microphone, S, uh, Sennheiser 421, pointed at each guitar cabinet. Now I use two microphones when I record yeah. guitars, but back then I only used one. Very nice. Okay. Before I move on, okay. any questions in the room about this record or about the strokes in general? Uh, when you were talking about recording uh, the strokes with eight mics, what kind of mic setup did you use? I had some good mics. I didn't have the best mics in the world, but I had some good mics. Some friends had given me some good mics to start with. I had some Bayer Dynamic microphones. I think I had a ribbon. And probably on the EP, I used three mics on the drums, like an overhead, a kick drum, and a snare, or something like that. And I had those 421 Sennheisers, which I still will talk about f forever these days. You know, it's such a useful mic. You know, kick drum, if you don't have a, a, I don't know, a kick drum mic you'd love, like I like. Beta 52, I think it's, yeah, Shure Beta 52 kick drum mic. But if a studio doesn't have that, I don't like those D12 and one, like those classic egg mics that everybody jumps up and down about, or Audix microphones. I think those sound like shit on kick drums. So if they don't have the uh, Beta 52, I'll take a Sennheiser 421, stick it in the kick drum, and it will do perfect every single time. And it's also good for acoustic guitar. One of the mics on acoustic guitar, electric guitar cabinet every time, tom-toms every time. So that microphone was in my arsenal, and I had one condenser mic, which was an Audio-Technica, which you know, got Julian's vocal sound for those albums, so I like it. Now I use Neumann's whenever possible, you know, but in those days, that's what I had. And a couple 57s, yeah. Do you still like to work fairly minimal with those kind of arrangements? No. I like to put a mic on each drum and a mic on the ride cymbal. I have an unusual technique for room mics. Like, I don't need to have a matched pair of microphones and when you listen to the room sound, it sounds like the band is in a room. I don't use it that way. I use it as a 3D machine. So that, and I only use one. I don't use two. I use one that's a room mic for the drums, even though the drums, for me, drums and the band and the amps are set up in a room this big. Like, they're set up, there's not one in a closet, there's not, I want everybody to hear their amps and not wear headphones and just jam, okay? So I put the mics in front, 
and I have a little condenser mic in front of the drum set that's really blowing up. That's like a room mic just for the drums. It's just supposed to be a distorter that's very quiet in the mix. And then I put another condenser mic through a compressor anywhere I want that doesn't feature just one instrument. And it's, again, just so that when the snare mic is hit and you get that close sound, you also have a far sound that you can blend in, which makes you think, like, where's that sound coming from? It's a little bit like a reverb or a bit like a delay, but it's so subtle. But if you take it away, it just sounds kind of boring and crispy and just like normal. And if you put it in a little bit, it sounds like, whoa, something just came to life. It's vital.